Hi, this is Dr. A with a clean camera view on liver diseases. All right, so let's first talk about jaundice. Jaundice or icterus is used to describe the yellow discoloration of the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes, which is most often resulting from the retention of bilirubin. Bilirubin is normally produced at a steady rate due to the turnover of red cells uh, to the hepatocytes detoxify bilirubin so that it can be excreted in bile. And so when you have jaundice, the process is being um, hampered in some way, or there's so much red cells have been destroyed, there's a lot of bilirubin that needs to be detoxified. And anyway, we're going to look at all the, all the ways jaundice can happen, and you have a pretty good picture here of what jaundice looks like. So um, jaundice is most commonly classified based on the site of the disorder. So where is the problem? It can be prehepatic, I mean before the liver, hepatic at the liver or post-hepatic, uh, meaning um, after the liver or as the bowel is leaving the liver. So prehepatic jaundice occurs when a problem is causing, causing the jaundice occurs prior to the liver metabolism. Some examples are hemolytic anemia, sickle cell crisis, and transfusion reactions. So basically anything that will lead to an increased amount of red cell destruction, therefore an increased amount of bilirubin being produced and arriving to the liver is going to cause prehepatic jaundice. Hepatic jaundice occurs when the primary problem causing the jaundice resides in the liver. Some examples would be uh, any intrinsic liver defect, genetics and stuff like that, or liver diseases such as hepatitis or cirrhosis, regardless of the cause. And then uh, in the, the problem there is uh, the hepatocytes are usually being destroyed or harmed, and so the hepatocytes are having of problems handling maybe even just a normal load of bilirubin that is coming from normal red cell metabolism and therefore backing up and causing uh, the jaundice. Post-hepatic jaundice results from biliary obstructive diseases, so uh, usually from a physical obstruction that prevents the flow of the conjugated bilirubin into the bile canaliculi. Um, gallstones or tumors are common causes of such obstruction. So the flow of bile is obstructed, and that is what is post-hepatic. So the hepatocytes are doing their job and all that. It's just the bile is having a hard time leaving the liver because there's blockages. So first, let's talk about cirrhosis. It is a condition in which scar tissue replaces the healthy liver tissue, and we know that scar tissue can't do stuff. It cannot detoxify and carry out liver functions. Um, and the scar tissue also blocks the blood flow uh, and just generally just prevents the proper functioning of the liver. It is commonly caused by chronic alcoholism and chronic hep C infections, but can also be caused by chronic hep B and hep D and um, autoimmune disorders or inherited disorders. Hepatitis is an injury to the liver that is characterized by inflammation in the liver tissues that is evident by high AST and ALT levels. Uh, the causes can be varied, um, so definitely viral, and when we think hepatitis, a lot of times our minds go straight to viral hepatitis. But it can also be bacterial, uh, parasitic infections, radiation, drugs, chemicals, autoimmune diseases, and toxins. All of these things can cause hepatitis. The symptoms of hepatitis are jaundice, a dark urine, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, especially in the right upper quadrants. Hepatitis A is the most common form of viral hepatitis worldwide. It is caused by infection with the hepatitis A virus via contaminated or improperly handled food, so it's oral fecal routes, and this virus is a small single-stranded RNA virus. Hepatitis B can cause both acute and chronic hepatitis. It is caused by an infection with a hepatitis B virus via parenteral, perinatal, or sexual transmission. Parenteral would be uh, like through IV puncture of the skin, like transfusions or drug use and that kind of stuff. DNA virus is a DNA virus with a central core in an envelope. And some of the serologic markers for hepatitis B infection are the hepatitis B core antigen, the hepatitis B surface antigen, and the hepatitis uh, envelope antigen, hepatitis B envelope antigen. Hepatitis C is caused by an infection with the hepatitis C virus via parenteral transmission. It is uh, primarily about blood transfusion, um, but also the sharing of needles and stuff like that. It is a single-stranded RNA virus. 
Hepatitis D is a unique subvirus satellite virus infection. It requires the hepatitis B surface antigen um, of hepatitis B virus for the replication. It can only occur in patients who ha already have hepatitis B, and hepatitis D is a single-stranded RNA virus. And then hepatitis E is caused by an infection with the hepatitis E virus, which is a non-enveloped RNA virus that is only uh, 27 to 34 nanometers in diameter. It is transmitted primarily by the fecal oral route, and it is characterized by waterborne epidemics in um, developing countries. So let's talk liver cancer and tumors. So 90 to 95% of hepatic malignancies are metastatic, so meaning they're not originating in the liver cells. So the primary location is not, uh, it's not liver cancer. So for example, it could be a breast cancer, those cancer cells into the liver, and then there's, there's liver cancer tumors that are actually all breast cancer tumors and they're in the liver. That's just one example. Uh, you can have benign tumors also, um, and those are called hepatocellular adenoma and hemangiomas, uh, but there's also malignant tumors. So you can have hepatocellular carcinoma, and that is liver cancer, or hepatocarcinoma or hepatoma. So those are all different types of liver cancers and tumors. The risk factors for liver cancer are alcohol abuse, hemochromatosis, uh, which is an overload in iron, and um, antitrypsin deficiency, and HBV, uh, which is hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus. Rye syndrome is a group of disorders that are caused by infectious, metabolic, toxic, or drug-induced disease that are found predominantly in children. Uh, they are often preceded by a viral syndrome, such as varicella, which is chickenpox, a gastroenteritis, or an upper respiratory tract infection, like the flu. It is associated with the ingestion of aspirin during the viral syndrome, because you used to use aspirin a lot uh, for children. Now, uh, if you will look, there, there aren't any aspirin in any of the children's medications, right? The acute illness is characterized by non-inflammatory encephalopathy, fatty de degeneration of the liver, and a clinical presentation of profuse vomiting and neurologic impairments. Then we have drug and alcohol related disorders. So drug and liver disease accounts for one third to one half of all reported cases of acute liver failure in the US. The most common mechanism of injury is an adverse immune response to the drug directed against the liver, because the drug is obviously being detoxified by the liver. Ethanol, which is alcohol, is the most significant cause of hepatic toxicity. So, you know, wine, beer, alcohol, but even the hard liquors, you know, tequila and all of that. Um, there are three stages of liver injury due to excessive alcohol consumption. You have first the alcoholic fatty liver disease, and is mild, and you can recover with a removal of the drug, which is basically quit drinking. Quit drinking, liver gets better, it heals up. Alcoholic hepatitis where you see evidence of liver damage, and then alcoholic cirrhosis, which is the most severe, and if it's progressed there, there's poor prognosis because with a cirrhosis you have scarring and there's no reversal of that. Then um, we have Gilbert syndrome, it's a genetic liver disease. You have reduced activity of buprenorphine transferase, which is needed to detoxify that bilirubin. Uh, so it, by conjugating it. The, it is the most common hereditary cause of hyperbilirubinemia uh, and occurs in 5 to 10 percent of the population. Most patients are asymptomatic with a very slight jaundice and their total bilirubin levels are 1 to 5 milligrams per dl. Kragler-Najjar syndrome, uh, there are two, there's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is a complete absence of glucuronal transferase, as we saw that we need to make conjugated bilirubin. It is potentially life-threatening, but rare. You see severe unconjugated bilirubinemia in Kernicterus, which is the accumulation of bilirubin in the fatty tissues in the, in the brain and stuff like that, causing brain damage. Um, and total bilirubin levels can be 20 to 50 milligrams per deciliter, which is really high. To type 2, uh, you just have decreased levels of glucuronal transferase, and you see chronic bilirubinemia, and the total bilirubin levels will be 7 to 20 milligrams per deciliter, which is still enough to cause jaundice and some problems. 
Dubin-Johnson syndrome is another genetic defect. It's a defect of bilirubin transport across the membrane that separates the hepatocytes from the biotinoliculi, so it can't like offload basically its bilirubin into the, its disposal system, right? Uh, so you'll see dark pigmentation of the liver and an unusual porphyrin excretion. And that is the last of our liver diseases.